Do you want to make games for the Playdate but have no idea where to start? In this video, I'll be teaching you how to program in Lua, one of the languages you can use for the Playdate SDK. This will be for complete beginners, so if you've never programmed a single line in your life, then this video is for you. Also, this would be a good refresher video for anyone who has programming knowledge but hasn't used Lua before. I was originally going to make a video on how to make this simple game, but I felt like it was a bit complex for complete beginners, so I'm going over the basics first, with concepts like variables, conditionals, functions, and more. There's a lot to cover, so I broke this out into a two-part series, with the second part coming out next Monday. Subscribe so you don't miss it, and let's get right into it. First, let's cover a fundamental concept of programming, which is the concept of variables. A variable is nothing more than a label given to a piece of data. Think of common game-related data, like health, a score, or your inventory. Those need to be kept track of somehow, which we can do with the help of variables. Since right now we're programming in pure Lua, you can follow along with me at this Lua demo website I've linked in the description, which will be much faster since you don't have to wait for the entire project to compile. If you instead want to follow along with me using the SDK, that's fine as well, but make sure to add this update function in your main file so the simulator doesn't crash. We can create a variable by simply typing out its name. I'll call this one a. We can set the data stored in the variable through something called assignment, which can be done with an equal sign. I'll set this variable to the value of 1. Whatever on the right of the equal sign gets assigned to the variable on the left. We can use a special command called print to display something in the console. Go ahead and write print a and build and run the script. If you're following along using the SDK, you won't see anything. But click on view, show debug console. You should see the output right here. On the website, it'll be more obvious. You can click execute here and it should appear in the output. I'll create another variable. Let's call this b and set this value as 10. If we print b, we can see 10 as well. You can see that these variables are essentially references to these values. Variables can actually be reassigned as well. Let's set a to a new value of 20. If we run the program, you'll see that the output value takes on a new value. This is because the program is run line by line, and since the assignment to 20 comes after the assignment to 1, the value when a gets printed out is going to be 20. So far, we've been working with just numbers, but what if we want to store text? You can't just write out a word because that will actually be interpreted as a variable. We need to wrap the text we write with quotations. This is what we call a string because it's a string of characters. Let's create a variable called greeting and set it to the string hello world. When printed, it's as you expect. Another important data type is the boolean, which can take on the values of true or false. This data type is important because in many cases, you are considering the condition of something. Does the player have a key to open the door? If true, then open the door. If false, then don't open the door. We can keep track of that using the boolean data type. Those can be explicitly assigned with true and false keywords. Another important data type to keep in mind is something called nil. This implies the absence of data. If you try printing out a variable that has nothing assigned to it, you will get nil. This is useful because sometimes you can't be sure if something exists or not. Maybe you're about to attack an enemy, but the enemy has already died and has been removed from the game. If you try to do something to it without first checking if it exists, then your game will crash. The discussion on data types leads directly into our next topic, which is operators. There are seven arithmetic operators. The first is addition, which we can use to either add two variables, a variable and a number, or just two numbers. The same things can be done with subtraction as well. We also have multiplication, which is denoted with an asterisk, division denoted with a forward slash, and taking the exponent, which is denoted with a caret. You can make any single number or variable negative by appending a negative sign in front of it. And lastly, we have something special called the modulus operator, denoted with the percent symbol. This gives you the remainder after integer division. For example, 17 mod 10 will give you 7. A special feature of the Playdate SDK that isn't normally present in Lua is the addition of assignment operators common in other programming languages. An example of this is the addition assignment operator. This syntax on the left is equivalent to the syntax on the right, but it's just shorter and more convenient to write. Next are relational operators. You have your less than, less than or equal to, greater than, and greater than or equal to which can be used to compare two numbers. Let's say you want to check if the player has died. Then you can check if the player health is less than or equal to zero. The result is a boolean, and you can check that with this small code snippet. The value of a is true since 20 is greater than 10. We also have equal to and not equal to. Equality is done with a double equal sign, since one equal sign is already used for value assignment. Not is denoted with a tilde. With the equal to and not equal to, we can use these on not just numbers, but strings and booleans as well. 
You can technically use the other relational operators on strings as well, but the result is not as intuitive because it's dependent on the position of the character on something called the ASCII table. For example, the letter A is less than the letter Z because A is equivalent to a lower number on the ASCII table. Not super important, so don't worry too much about it. Next, we have logical operators, AND, OR, and NOT, which are used in conjunction with Boolean values. If we take two conditions, AND returns true only if both conditions are true and false otherwise. An example of where this would be useful is if you needed to check if the player has killed a certain number of enemies and has a key before moving on to the next level. If we take two conditions, OR returns true if any of the conditions are true, and false only when both conditions are false. An example of where this would be useful is if you want to swing a sword if the crank is used, or the player presses the A button. The last logical operator is NOT. This simply turns a false condition true or true condition false. Feel free to try out these operations on your own. Two more miscellaneous operators is dot dot and the pound sign. Dot dot concatenates or combines two strings. Let's say you have two variables, reading and player name. If you concatenate these two strings and print the result, you will get the combined string. The pound sign returns the length of the string. This string, hello world, has 11 characters, which includes the space. So this will result in 11. So we're covering a lot of things related to Booleans, which might be something you've never heard of up until this point. So what's up with that? The main reason is because of how decision making in programs work. You might have heard of the phrase, if this, then that. We can check different conditions based on the state of a game. And if the condition is met, we can execute a specific action. We do this by using if statements. The format is if condition, then do something, and you finish it off with an end. One thing that this condition can be is a variable. Let's set this variable has key to true. Then if we do if has key then, and inside the if statement we put print player has key and end it off, and then run it, you should see that the statement gets printed. Notice that the print statement is indented. This is to make it more obvious that the code is within the if statement and only runs if the condition is true. If you change has key to false, you can see that the statement is not printed. If you want to print something when the condition is not met, you can add an else to the code. This catches any condition that isn't met with a previous if statement. We can print the player does not have a key here, and we can see that gets printed instead. Let's say you want to check multiple conditions. We can do that with else if statements. Let's create a variable player state and set it to the string standing. Then we can write an if statement to check if the player state is equal to standing. And if that condition is true, we can make a print statement. However, we can also check if player state is sitting using else if, and then we can print that instead. Finally, we can catch any other condition with an else statement and then print player state concatenated with the player is string. Feel free to mess around to see how changing the state or the conditional statements alters the result. Notice how we put a relational operator in this part of the if statement. You can put anything here, even if it's a long chain of operations, and you can change the order of operations using parentheses, as long as the final result is a single boolean. If you try to make your game as a giant block of if statement, it's going to become really hard to find where things are and change things as well. Also, what if you want to reuse a piece of code? It doesn't make sense to copy and paste it over and over. One way to deal with this issue is by breaking up the code with something called functions. A function is a group of statements that performs a task. Let's say you wanted to check if something in the game has died. We can create a function by using the function keyword, then the name, which we can call is dead, and then a parentheses. We can optionally pass in data into this function, which I'll call health, then close it off with an end. Inside the function, we can return a value by writing return health less than or equal to zero. Now we can call this function by writing the name of the function and passing in some number, which we call the argument. You can see for 10, the function returns false. But for negative 10, the function returns true. You now have this little piece of reusable code that has a name. Let's try making a more complex function. Let's create a function called get attack damage that has two inputs, which we separate with a comma. In this context, we call the names of the inputs parameters, while the actual values of the things being passed in as arguments. Kind of confusing, but not that important. The first one is base, which is the base attack amount, and bonus, which is a boolean on whether or not we should deal bonus damage. We can assign the base amount to the variable called damage. If bonus is true, then we double the damage. And lastly, we return the damage. As you can see, you can put any amount of logic you want into these functions. If I pass in the values 10 and true, you can see the result is 20. However, we run into an issue. What if you define another variable also called damage somewhere else in your code? Whenever you call this function, that damage variable will be overwritten by this one. You could name it something else like damage one, but that will get messy really quickly. 
This is where the concept of scope comes in. What we can instead do is explicitly define this damage variable to only exist within the bounds of this function by writing local before it, because this variable is local to the function. We call this limiting scope. We can test this behavior by using our get attack damage function. If we don't declare damage as local, and we call the function and print out the value of damage, then we get what damage was set to inside of the function. This is because variables are by default considered globally scoped, which means they can be accessed anywhere, even in other files. Imagine how much of a mess it would be if everything is global. You can create some serious bugs without even realizing it by unintentionally changing values. If we change damage to be local, you can see now that the value of damage doesn't exist outside of the function, so it's nil. We can also declare another variable with the same name, and you can see that it maintains its value as it never gets touched by the function. These function arguments that get passed in are considered local as well. We covered a lot so far, and if you're confused and need to rewatch things to understand it, that's okay, because I've squeezed a few classes worth of Computer Science 101 into one video. Feel free to leave comments or ask questions in my Discord if you need help. If you're watching this when this video comes out, next week we'll be covering the second half of this introduction to Lua crash course, in which we'll go over tables, loops, using import, how to make sense of the Playdate SDK, and more. If you watched all the way to the end of the video, I hope that means it was helpful to you. So if you don't mind liking the video, that'll help me a lot by helping this video reach more people. Thank you to all my patrons for making stuff like this possible, and see you next time.